shall, uh, I shall start in a minute. I just want to start by saying thank you very much to, uh, to Bill and to John and to everybody for asking me to come along and talk about uh, Walkley Reform Club and the, Walk the, Walkley, the lads of Walkley Reform Club and the Sheffield Powers in the First World War. About 20 years ago, when I first moved to Sheffield, I uh, lived in Walkley just on South Road and I must have walked past the end of First Street a dozen, a dozen times before uh, once I was in here for a storytelling uh, an evening that they had uh, but I had no idea at all of the nature of the place or the nature of the people who lived and worked here and it was a great privilege and a great opportunity for me to come back and and see the place again with fresh eyes. I, 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 I've never been in Sheffield anymore, but I got the train, and I was walking up from the train station up through Western Park and up here, and, and having lived in Sheffield for all this time, suddenly it was like coming to a new place, because I wasn't just walking up from the train station up the hill towards town anymore. I was walking the path that the Sheffield Pals had marched down to the Midland Station when they went down to get the train off to Canon in 1915. Uh, when I walked through Western Park, I wasn't just walking past Ebenezer Elliott's statue and the War Memorial. I was walking past, by, well, I was walking past the memorial to the, to the Yorks and Lancaster Regiment. And having spent time learning a little bit about the stories of the nine men who died, it were commemorated in the window above. And walking along South Road by St Mary's Church and seeing the memorial there and the little wooden crosses that are there and seeing the names of the nine men who died written on the crosses there. It made the whole thing feel very alive to me, and it made me see Sheffield and see Walkley with new eyes in a way that I've never seen it before, and it's, it's a great privilege. But the story starts, the story of the Sheffield Pals and the story of the other regiments in which, in which the, the, the lads of Sheffield and Walkley fought, starts 100 years ago today, and it starts about here, because obviously, as we all know, a lot of the lads lived quite close about here. Isaac Haycock lived only on Howard Road down there. Arnold Turner lived on Camp Street. Frank Hartley lived on Aldred Road. Uh, they lived and grew up here. They lived and grew up in the Walkley as it was 100 years ago. And I think if you look at the photographs and the other evidence of the place, I think in many ways Walkley 100 years ago would have looked a lot like the way it does today. The houses would have been the same houses. The streets would have been the same streets. The roads would have been the same roads because there would have been no cars or fewer cars and there would have been trams going up and down South Road, I believe. And there would have been that smell of smoke in the air, the smell of coal and the smell of smoke from the steelworks. And the other thing that I think would have been the big difference, or one of the big differences, was the fact that I think the houses would probably have been a lot more crowded. Because when you look at the records <coughs> of the nine men who died, then they were all the fifth or the sixth of seven or eight children, and there were these, these big fat. And there was one, James Craven, who lived on Providence Road. And he, when, he was, when he was three years old, his father died. And his father died of a very lingering and painful disease, and he died at home. And it wasn't so long after that before his mother remarried. And so not only was James there with his mum and his sister, he had a stepfather and he had a couple of stepsisters as well. And according to the records, as far as you can tell by reading between the lines, because very often you have to, the thing that I have to do to understand the stories of these men is to read between the lines because the records don't tell you everything about them. And I think that's something that comes up very, very, very often with the history of the Great War because there is so much that was not said. My mum's father, my granddad, was in, fought in the First World War and he fought on the artillery battalion. And it was only after he died that I really began to realise what he'd done because he would say very little about the war while he was alive and that was a very common thing. So when you start to look at the stories of the men who fought, in, in, you've, you've got to, in a sense, you're, you're unearthing them from the silence in which they've been left. And James Craven, as far as the clue that you can tell, James Craven never got on with his stepsisters. Who knows, perhaps after his father died, he, it would be natural for him not always to get on with his, with his mother's new husband and, and, and the, the, the stepbrothers and stepsisters that he brought along. And when he enlisted, the clue that we've got is the fact that when he enlisted, and they asked him if he had any brothers or sisters. He listed his own sister, but he never said anything about any stepbrothers or any stepsisters. And he went off and he joined the rifle brigade. <laughs> so it was a crowded community, and it was a very busy community as well. I've been doing some research on, on Tinsley and I found, uh, for, for something else, and I found that the locals, there was a poem put in the paper about Tinsley around about the early 1900s. 
And all it was was a bit of a joke at the expense of all the Tinsley folk, but what it did was it just listed them by name, and what they did for a trade, and what they did for a living, and it just went right the way through the village like that. And I read this poem, and there's some jokes in it, and some, some banter, and some, some, you know, some jokes at the expense of someone who's mean, or someone else who's always in the pub. But you realise when you look at the end of the, when, when I got to the end of the poem, I realised that if you lived in Tinsley in around 1900, anything that you could possibly want in life, virtually, was made or built or produced by somebody who probably lived a stone's throw from your front door. And Walkley, I think, was the same. There was metalsmiths, there was silversmiths, there was a lad who's up there on the window by the name of Frank Hartley. And Frank Hartley is always the one who sticks in my memory, because if you look at the photo of them, it's like most of, most, most of the photos, they've not managed to get pictures of all the men. Uh, but when they have, they're all, they're all stood to attention, looking very proud and very soldier-like. Apart from Frank Hartley, if you see his photo, he's stood there with a cigarette in his hand, <laughs> leaning against the wall. I always got the impression that if, any, if there was a problem with military insubordination in the, uh, in the Sheffield City Battalion, I have a sneaking suspicion that Frank Hartley would generally have been at the bottom of it more often than not, judging by his appearance. But Frank Hartley's dad was a silver fluter. And what that meant was that he, were, he, he, had, he worked mainly from home, as far as I can tell, and he had a number, of, a number of people working for him. And what they did was, they would take these plain silver vessels that had, been, that had been factory made, and they would decorate them by hand before they went on to sale. And the remarkable thing was that they would decorate them by hand, and the silver itself was so thin that if you marked it by hand, it would break. And so what they would do would be boil up big kettles of pitch, pour them into these vessels when they were un undecorated, leave the pitch to set, and then when the pitch was hard, it was the, the, the vessel was tough enough to mark up, and then they would decorate it. When then that was done, they would heat up the pitch and pour it out, and then the vessel, the, 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 finished, the finished vessel would go on for sale. And so Frank Harvey and his sister Nelly seemed to have spent most of their childhood sitting at home, boiling up kettles of pitch and kettles of pitch for their dad as he was, as he was producing this stuff. People worked hard and they lived on top of each other. And there, in the middle of Walkley, back in 19, from 1909, there was the Reform Club. And it took me a long while to realise what the Reform Club was. The Reform Club, if it was to be set up today and described in today's language, it would probably be called a politically correct alternative to going to the pub. <laughs> because there were many, you know, many, is the, many is the tale that was told of a, a quiet pipe that was enjoyed in congenial company on the licensed premises of Sheffield at the time, but there were other things that went on in pubs as well, and it was generally considered to be a good thing if the young men of Sheffield could be given an alternative. And the alternative is what surrounds us now. It was set up in 1909 with the specific uh, objective of giving mainly the young men something to do which didn't involve getting the tram into town and going off and getting hammered. And so that's why there are billiard tables upstairs. I'm just told today that they're, I think, the oldest billiard tables in the country. They used to have whist drives. They used to have, there, there was a flower arranging club. There was a bowling, I think there was a bowling green out the back. There was concerts and there was newspapers. And it was a way for people to come and have some of the, the, the relatively few hours of leisure that they had. They could come and spend it here instead of going into town and, and, and going on the match. And so most of the members of the club were generally young men. Most of the nine who went off to, to enlist were, were, were young men in their, around the age of about 20. If you're about 23 or 24, then you were, you were getting on to be an old man in terms, of the, in terms of the nine men. And only one of them was married and his name was Arthur Wall. And they used to come here. And if you read the minutes of the meetings that they had in August 1914, if you read the minutes of the meetings and the things that they were discussing, as Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, as Austria threatened to invade Serbia as a reprisal, as Russia decided that they were going to step in to support Serbia if Austria invaded, as the whole of Europe fell in like a house of cards, here they were sat in the Reform Club at Walkley, talking about how they were going to organise the billiard tournament, and whether the prize for a billiard tournament ought to be a cup or a medal. And the last set of minutes that I've had the opportunity to look at were around August and September 1914, in which it was recorded, well, the, the, the essence of it, the gist of it, was that as long as the sun shone through the windows of the club, any man who went off to serve his country would be guaranteed a welcome when he came home. But obviously they didn't put it that poetically. <coughs> what they said was that membership subscriptions would be suspended without prejudice to one's status as a member of the club pending military service. 
and also the billiard tournament of people's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and on that basis, about 60 members of the club went off, probably on the tram, into Sheffield to join in an end list. As, as, you know the history. The British Expeditionary Force had gone off to France. At that point in the war, they were still, and I'm not making this up, literally, they were, they, they were riding into battle on horses with spears. It was like jousting. And everybody thought that the war would be a quick thing that was a bit like the Boer War, only it would all be over by Christmas. And, and <coughs> Kitchener was summoning an army, and he wanted so many millions of men, and there was Hal Fisher at the university who was setting up what was originally known as the Sheffield and University City and University Battalion, but was quickly shortened to the Sheffield City Battalion. And they announced that recruiting would begin in about <coughs> on, on a certain date. And six of the nine men as mended up in the city battalion. And that took some doing, because when they got now, the, the gates opened, it was held at the Corn Exchange, which was near, uh, near about where, where Park Square is now. It, it, it burned down in the 60s. And they were queuing out at the Corn Exchange. There was a sign outside the Corn Exchange saying, to Berlin via the Corn Exchange. And they were queuing there because they didn't want to miss their chance of getting into the war. They thought that if they left it too late, then the war would go ahead and they'd miss it. So they were down there, and there was a queue down there of men waiting to enlist. There were the local pubs were sending beer and sandwiches across. And in the space of two days, the city battalion filled up its complement of men. And then they all thought that they were going to march off to war. And they were sent home, without so much as a uniform. Because there were so many men that enlisted, there wasn't even uniforms to give them. And this was difficult on a practical basis because some of them, at that point, there was one fellow who saw, he went down and he enlisted at the Corn Exchange. He was living in Diggs. And he told his landlady he was going off to enlist. And then he went down to enlist. He was told that he was going to go home because there was nothing else for them to do but go home and wait until they were sent for. He went home and by the time he got back, his landlady had left the room. <laughs> and so all she could do was put him in the attic and she still charged him rent for it. <laughs> and the city battalion, that was how the Sheffield City Battalion, including six, six of the nine men, began. And they began by marching. They thought they were going to go. Uh, to, truth to tell, it was said, and I believe it was probably said with some justice, that half the reason why the men joined the city battalion was because, you know, they were all sort of 18, 19, 20, 21. You weren't going to get a date in Sheffield in, in autumn 1914 unless you were in uniform. And so it is a particular cruelty that there was no uniforms to give them. And then by the time they got the uniforms, they were known as Kitchener's Blues. And they'd been run up in a hurry, and when they put them on, as they marched through the streets of Sheffield, people thought that they were driving convicts from the local prison into the <laughs> army for the military effort. So, off they marched, and they started doing their, their square dashing, as it was known, the parade ground exercises, and they did it at no lesser place than Bramall Lane. Sheffield United football ground, and they were marching up and down, and there's photos of them, you can see them trying to stand to attention with their, with their jackets on, on the turf at their feet, marching up and down, straight line, shoulder off, you know, all that, round the corner, and all, 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 all the sort of... It, it only took a few weeks for the football club to complain because they were spoiling the turf. And then they would go back into Sheffield and, 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 and then continue. <coughs> By December, they were told that they were going to be marching up for further training at the camp that was just been set up at Red Myers. And if you look at the photos of the, the, the photos of the march to Red Myers, it happened on the 5th of December 1914. It was hailing, it was sleeting, it was snowing, it was a miserable day. And they marched up and they left their home city and up to Red Myers they went. And they looked like a bunch of fellas going out to a cricket match in the snow, you know, <laughs> like that. They, they got up to Red Myers. And when they got there, the camp was only half built, the sheds were half empty, they pretty much had to build and make everything themselves. They sat there, and they shivered, and all of that winter, they practiced digging trenches, and if you go out to Red Mines, you can still see the practice trenches that they dug. And they lived there, and they, they, get, they became known. At this point, there were pounds battalions, as they were known, springing up over the whole of the country. And they all got to know each other. Sheffield was particularly close to Accrington and Barnsley, they were all, in, they were all battalions together. And they and the reputation of the Sheffield City Battalion, they were known as the Coffee and Bun Boys, because whenever they were always really good at getting the kettle on in difficult circumstances. 
In the end, they trained and they dug and they dug all these trenches and when they thought that they could get away with it, they used to hop over the road to the Three Merry Lads. That was the place that you went, to, went for a drink, unless you could hop back into Sheffield because a lot of them... The strategy of joining the army in order to get a date had worked for some of these men and they were hopping back into Sheffield to, 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 to visit friends and family and girlfriends. And when the new year came down, then they were informed that they were going to be marching away to Cannock for further training. And so this group of men who, judging by the photographs, had gone up to Red Myers on the 5th of December, looking, frankly, a little bit of a shambles, came marching back down towards the Midland Station. And I'm sure, again, if the, if the photographs are anything to judge by, when Sheffield saw them marching down towards the station to go on to Cannon, then they must have looked, everybody must have looked around and seen what has Red Myers done to our husbands and sons and fathers? What has Red Myers done to our cousins? What has Red Myers done to our men? Because they went up to Red Myers looking like a cricket team, and they've come back from Red Myers looking like soldiers. They got on the train, there was a parade, they were wished all the best by the Lord Mayor, and off they went to Cannock, and they trained at Cannock, and off they went to Winchester, and they trained at Winchester, and all the while what they were thinking was, when are we going to actually get out there, when are we going to get out there and do some good? And the, ba the main anxiety that they had was, was, was seemingly, from the, from, the rec from the records, was that they were worried that they were, were going to miss, miss the action. And it became all the clearer that there was action to be missed in mid-1915 when the first death of a member of Walkley Reform Club was reported. It was a lad called Archie Shelley. And he had not joined the City Battalion. He had joined the Grenadiers. And he had gone off and fought, and he had been caught in gunfire near a village called Festubert. And he'd been brought back wounded from the battlefield. He had, a, he had a wound to his head. And he was in a bad way, but, then, but, he, but he survived long enough for them to get back from the field hospital back to London. And he died in the London hospital without ever fully regaining consciousness. He was brought back to Sheffield. He's lying now in Walkley Cemetery. And there was a funeral held for him in which the, 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 his family and all his friends in the whole city put notices in the paper and he's there to this day. That was mid-1915. By 1915, Sheffield City Battalion were beginning to complete their training at Winchester, and then the day came when they were all hauled on parade and stood up and told by the commanding officer that their training was now complete and they now had five days leave. And of course, most of them hopped on the train and came straight back to Sheffield. And they started doing the very thing which Walkley Reform Club had probably been founded to prevent them from doing. They went for a pint, and another pint, and several more pints. And uh, rumour has it that uh, engagements and weddings were hurriedly arranged and announced over the course of those five days. And the other thing that happened, tragically enough, or ironically enough, is that by the time they got back to Sheffield at that point, then there were shops and there were businesses in the city, which had been in the city for many years, which were run by Germans, by families of German origin. Many of them, they were German by family, but they'd been in England for, for all of their lives, if not for several generations. As soon as the war came round, then they were all just Germans. And they were hung in effigy outside their own shops. People broke windows and went in and held themselves and started looting. And it was obvious, it was clear, that the war was changing the way in which the city thought about itself. But the five days leave came up. The Sheffield Pals, the five or six from the Reform Club who were in the City Battalion, George Barnett, Isaac Haycock, Frederick Moses, Frank Hartley and Arnold Turner, got back on their trains, got back from visiting their families and their girlfriends and their friends, and back down they went, and then off on the train they went until they came to the port. And there, you can imagine, the, the, the rumours were right of where they were going. They didn't really know where they were going to be sent, but they thought... They were hearing the news just the same as everyone else. They were hearing the fact that this wonderful jousting war that had been expected that was going to be over by Christmas wasn't happening. They understood that there was a new theory called attrition, and the theory of attrition stated that the objective wasn't to push the other army back, it was just to kill as many of the enemy as you possibly could, and that was the point at which the casualty count really started to mount up. And they were missing it all, and God bless them, all they wanted to do was get in there and, and join in. And when they were on the ship, when they were stashing their kit down in the hold, and when they were cramming themselves into those bunks, that was when they found out that they weren't going anywhere near France at all. They were going to Alexandria. 
And you can imagine, Alexandria, where's Alexandria? They were going to guard the Suez, but on paper they were going to guard the Suez Canal from Turkish incursions. As the photographic and the evidence, photographic evidence and the other evidence shows, guarding the Suez Canal from Turkish incursions involved a lot of swimming in the canal, drinking tea, buying and selling camels, fleecing each other blind at cards, and other traditional soldierly pursuits. And that was the only occasion, I believe, on which Sheffield City Battalion ever got to wear the proper pith helmets and look like Empire soldiers. And according to some of the records that I've read, they even got to wear the naggy Bermuda shorts. But <laughs> the photographic evidence I've seen contradicts that somewhat. Anyway, they sat by the Suez Canal in the hot sun, watching Canadian and Australian and colonial troops marching past them, and the only thing that they were ever told by any of these platoons who were marching north was that they were going off to finish the Germans. And all they could do was sit there and beg and hope that they'd leave a few Germans left over for the Sheffield lads by the time they got there. And of course the, uh, the Australians and Canadians responded in characteristically forthright military manner, and then they disappeared off to France. And then, after uh, several months of this, the city boys got told that they were too we had to get ready to move. And they knew that the battle at Verdun continued. They knew that there was going to be a big push. The Western Front had stalled, and they were going to, there was going to be a big push to try and push the Germans back. And along with many another soldier, they believed that they were going into the big push. And they found that their expectations were met when they got on the ship at Alexandria and they ended up landing at Marseille. And from Marseille, there was the usual chaos on the station forecourt. They entrained again, and four days and four nights, they sat on this train that moved all the way through France. By the time they got on, they were fairly clean and tidy. By the time they got off, they were absolutely covered in lice. They sat on top of each other, smoking and continuing to fleece each other at cars. By the time they got to Paris, they changed trains. There was another frantic episode of chaos as they moved from one train to another, and they got the train from Paris out to Amiens. And from Amiens, they got out, and they got onto the platform, and they formed up, and they began to march. And then began their first proper experience of that long, days long, day and night, soul-crushing, marching round the clock. They would march along the ranks. They would fall asleep while they were marching and wake up and find themselves still marching. Their boots and their feet and their boots swole, got swollen to the point where by they could barely take their boots off. And after days and days and days of this marching, they fetched up and they came to a town, the name of which is Albert. And it's a curious thing, but Albert had a church, and on top of the church, they all saw the golden statue of the Virgin Mary that had stood there in the beginning of the war. But since the beginning of the war, there had been a bombardment, and what had happened was the golden statue had been knocked off its perch. But it hadn't fallen to the ground. It was hanging sideways, held on by these steel anchoring rods. And the one thing that every soldier knew when they passed through Albert was the story or the belief that when the Virgin Mary fell from the top of Albert Church, then, and only then, would the war come to an end. And so they passed through Albert. The town was half a ruin. It was full of spivs and deserters who were all trying to sell them German military memorabilia, which they claimed to have caught in battle. Um, they left it all behind and left it all through, and they started marching on, and they began another one of these marches east of Albert towards the front. And after another two or three or four days of this marching, they came to a farmhouse where there was a farmer living with his wife, and they were living there in rags. And they were billeted in these tents in the yard of the farmhouse, and that was where they put up them. Of course, by that point, as soldiers, they were betting better at making the best of what they had, and they settled down there in relative ease and comfort. And they found out that although the farmer and his wife were all covered in rags, they never seemed to be short of food, and they never seemed to be short of cigarettes. And they thought there was something rather strange about this until they overheard the farmer and his wife referring to them as les autres boches. And that means the farmers, they called them the other Germans. And basically, the French farmers, the Belgian farmers, hated them almost as much as they hated the Germans, but of course they couldn't afford to care. And they remained there for a few weeks, and you could see on the horizon there was the banging and the flashing, and the sound of guns and shells going off. And of course, as soon as they got there, they would flinch whenever they saw one of those, but whenever anybody came back along the road from the direction of the front, then they knew that the experienced soldiers would just be able to look at them and say, 
no, that's one of theirs, that's one of ours. They could tell the ordinance by the sound that it made as it fell through the, through the air. The first experience that they had of service at the front, directly at the front, came early on in the summer of 1916, when a pack of about 20 of them went up to relieve one of the frontline trenches. And the way that it happened was this. The NCOs and the officers, and one or two volunteers, were all told that they were, going, they were going to be going up to the front for two or three weeks. And they found that they, their parked outside the camp was an old, it was actually a London bus that had been painted grey, and they hopped on, to, on top of this bus, and away they went off, down, rumbling down the village road. And after several miles of this, the bus overheated, and they had to get out and push it to one side, so that the rest of the traffic behind could come through. And as they were doing this, they looked over in the field, and there in the field, was paddocks were a, a, a was a cavalry was some cavalry men with their horses and they were there and as soon as the bangs and the whistles from the shells up at the front would go overhead then the horses would start and the cavalry men would start to get the horses out of the way the, the lads eyes at Haycock and Frank and, and Fred would look round <coughs> at the uh, the sergeant and sergeant just looked out the window and he says cavalry he says cavalry won't win this war says they're no use only for getting in the way. What will win this war is boots and bombs. When they, by the time they pushed the bus out of the way, the driver said, if you want to get to the trenches, he says, you just hop across that field, two fields down there, there's a little wood, and there's a little lane coming out of the wood. You just go along that and just keep walking. And so they got out, and they, they yoked across these two fields, and they found a little wood, and they found a little lane, and just as they'd been told, they started walking across it. And they kept walking and they kept walking and they kept walking down this lane. And little by little, the walls of the lane began to rise around them until they realised that they weren't walking down a country lane at all. They were walking through a trench with sandbags on the top. And all the while, the bangs and the flashes on the horizon were getting louder and closer. And they started seeing troops coming the other way. And the strange thing about these men, there were men coming marching back from the front. They were muttering to themselves and talking to each other as they were marching up. And as they came in, they were all ready to say hello, but the men coming back from the front didn't even pay them the slightest bit of attention. They didn't even say hello. They didn't even know, seem to notice that they were there. They just kept on talking and walking back. And they walked all the way down until they came to the front line trench where they were taught. And, and, and they, for the first time on active service, they found themselves face to face dealing with men of their own side who had been seeing service at the front. And the way that it was was this. There was a big gun, and there was a sentry overlooking the trench. And there was a young lad sat there by the gun, and he couldn't have been more than 17. And as they approached, they just looked up, and he said, are you the Sheffield lads? And they said they were. And he said, you're late. <laughs> and after that, they wouldn't give them so much of a kind word all the time. They didn't quite know what they were supposed to do. 